yeah. on this episode of Bondi Vet. If we don't do the surgery, she's going to constantly have urinary tract infection. Arvid sets out to correct a birth defect that's making a happy dog miserable. So we got to allow her to have the most comfortable life going forward as possible. Did she have fairly straight eyes before? Um, I don't know. Chris worries a tiny kitten might have brain damage after a freak accident. What we're looking at here are the classic signs of a stroke. So his hip joint is no good, it's cactus. And Scott delivers devastating news to pet owners who know tragedy only too well. It's such an extraordinary run of bad luck for these guys. Sometimes life is just so cruel. In Atlanta, Georgia, Jeff and Mary Clarice know their dog Scout and Bear adore them. Okay, everybody down. Everybody All right, down. everybody off. Now y'all can bite each other. We got Bear first. They're siblings and litter mates, but we went and picked him up first. And two days later, he was like, you know, why don't we go back and get the sister? I said, you've lost your mind. Come here. Come here, Girl Scout. But we went back and got her, and I wouldn't trade her for the world. She's a good girl. Ready? She is a Paradoodle, Golden Doodle mix. She's got such a fun personality. I can't imagine not having her. Even when she chews the furniture. <laughs> you my good girl. You my good girl. But recently, Mary Clarice noticed 18-month-old Scout wasn't the playful, happy girl they know and love. She walked into our bedroom and has an accident on the carpet, but it looked like it was mostly blood. We took her to like an urgent care vet and they discovered her lady parts were recessed. And this is something that would need to be surgically fixed. But if you don't, then she could potentially have issues the rest of her life. Good girl. One of those issues is a current urinary tract infection, which Scout has been taking antibiotics to combat. Hello, hello. Hey, good morning. How, how are you? How are you doing? We're good. doing good. Scout, how are you? The infection is now under control, so Mary Clarice has brought Scout to Dr. Arvid for treatment on her congenital abnormality. She's like, I don't know. I don't know. This guy is back. I don't trust him. <laughs> so Scout's come today with a recessed or inverted vulva, which creates a problem, especially when she's trying to urinate. And she's been having these recurrent urinary tract infections that have gotten bad to the point where she was urinating blood. So this is something that we've got to take care of and we've got to take care of it right away. You're being a good girl. And you can see here where it was infected in that fold. Yeah. See how red? Oh yeah. And irritated there. If we don't do the surgery, what's gonna happen is she's gonna constantly have urinary tract infections, right. and, uh, dermatitis, vaginitis, etc. She's young. We don't want any She's not even two yet. We don't want any yes. itis. <laughs> so we gotta allow her to have the most comfortable life going forward as possible. Right. And the surgery is gonna do that. Okay. Okay. Perfect. That's what we want. We just want you to feel better. Scout's mom is a very concerned mom, protective mom. She says she's not worried, but when people tell you they're not worried, they're worried. So the only way to eliminate this worry is to take care of Scout's problem. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. Love you, girlfriend. Yes. Thank you so much, oh, Dr. Edward. Absolutely, you're welcome. We appreciate you're, you taking good care of our girl. You're very welcome. A little nervous now. My dogs are my kids, so it's like shipping my kid off. But I know it's best for her, so she'll do great. I'll be counting down to when I can go back and pick her up. Now that she's gone, I'm ready to get her back and get her back home. Time to go night-night. She's got a rough start to life. The scout's condition is pretty severe. Her inverted vulva is one of the worst I've seen. There's a skin flap that's covering the area where the urine comes out. 
So as scalp urinates, the urine gets trapped, which causes infections. So the surgery is designed to replace the vulva in its normal anatomical position so she can go on to have normal urinations and eliminate these recurrent urinary tract infections. So I have to reconstruct this to remove all that entire skin flap. So I'm trying to measure the tissue to kind of see how much tissue I need to take out of here. Too tight, then there's too much tension, which ultimately can cause the incision to open up or not getting enough tension and the infections continue. Right now, cutting the skin and then I have to get down and get a lot of some of the muscle and connective tissue. This surgery is more difficult than I thought. Removing all this excess skin and fat is not an easy thing to do because that's a very vascular area, which means it bleeds a lot. And right now, it's hard for me to get a grasp on the tissues to be able to cut them effectively. So now I'm just still cutting away some of the connective tissue and then be ready to close this girl up. So now I'm beginning the close up process and uh, hopefully I took enough skin out so that the recessed vulva won't return. So far is looking how I would like for it to look. Surgery's done. It actually looks a little better than I thought it would. As Scout recovers from what everyone is hoping will be life-changing surgery, Mary Clarice has arrived, anxious to be reunited with the little girl she loves like a daughter. They said the surgery went great. So it's been a few hours, but, um, but I can't wait to see her, get her home. You ready to go? You're ready. All right, let's go. Hey, baby. Oh, I'm so sorry you have to wear the cone. Hey, honey. Hey, my sweet bag. She is sweet. She did very well. Good. Like I said, she'll have a little drainage back there. Okay. But she's doing well. Doing okay. very well. The stitches will come out in two weeks. Oh, wow. I mean, you had to, like, get all in there. Yeah, it was a lot. She looks like one of those little monkeys that doesn't have hair on her, <laughs> The little baboon. <laughs> <laughs> she is definitely ready to go home so she can start her healing process and get on the way to living a normal life. All right, you have a good day. Thank you. And we'll be talking with you soon. All right, come on, baby come girl. Come on, Scout. There we go. Scout, I'm right here. Oh, yeah, you guys. I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> Two weeks later, Arvid is making a house call to remove Scout stitches. I'll let you scratch my belly all day. Let's see how we're looking. Oh yeah, that looks much better. Her incision is looking fantastic. So that should alleviate the problems of the recurrent urinary tract infections. She's going to be a happy camper and feel much better going forward. The 18-month-old is recovering well and urinating normally. Oh, we're done. Yes. We are done. Got it. Good girl. Hey. Great hey. job. I'm so excited that we're done. And she can resume her normal life and be crazy and wild and run. We're just thankful that it's over with, but also very thankful that it went well. You did fantastic. You're a great patient. You're a great patient. You know it, don't you? You know it, don't you? Yes. Yeah. As a vet, the best advice that I can give pet owners is this. Think carefully about the choices that you make on behalf of your pet and you can literally save their lives. And if you make healthy choices, you will have a healthier pet. Come on through. At the Bondi Clinic, Little eight-week-old kitten Coco has arrived in the arms of his anxious owner, Robert. OK, so just explain what's happened. Um, the dog walker found her under our dining room table. Yep. It's got a V-leg. Yep. She was lying upside down with her head stuck between the legs of the... Wow, OK. And we don't know for how long. Yep. We left home at about nine, so yep. this was about half past 12, so... And so it could have been anywhere up to three hours. Yeah. My real fear is that she dies, and uh, I have to explain that to 
two kids that have gotten to really like her a lot, well, don't really know what we'll do then. And when she was actually freed, what did she do? According to the dog walker, she collapsed. She yeah. went completely limp. And then when she put her down, she just couldn't walk. At first glance, Coco isn't in a good way. She's been wedged in that table leg for anywhere up to three hours. And my worry is that in the effort to try to free herself, she may have actually done more damage. When you have two bars pushing inside of your neck, you can get a situation where either you have uh, all the blood going to your mm. brain but not being able to get back Mac, from it, yeah. or you have not enough blood going there in the first place. Yeah. Did she have fairly straight eyes before? Um, I don't know. The thing is, this left eye, mm -hmm is deviated off to the left, whereas the, the right one is in a normal position. Yeah. Look, structurally, the rest of her feels OK. To be honest, if you ignore what's happened to Coco today and ignore her age and just look at the symptoms she's showing, what we're looking at here are the classic signs of a stroke. I can feel a little heart racing quite quickly there at the moment. So what we need to do is just try to reverse this sort of semi-comatose state we've got at the moment. So. My feeling is that her brain's gone through some sort of shock there, yeah. um, which is now affecting the rest of her body. What I'd like to do is do two things. First of all, get her on some oxygen just okay. to help stabilise her, but also give her something for the shock, okay. something that's going to take away any swelling that she might have on her brain. My hope at the moment is that it's just exhaustion from her trying to free herself from that table leg. But the big concern is obviously she may have a serious brain injury. I'm just going to sleep over here. Chris is giving little Coco oxygen to try to alleviate the effects of shock. Coco's body is essentially playing tricks on her. It's panicking, which means she's taking shallow breaths, and shallow breaths just aren't effective enough. She's taking deeper breaths there, which is good. The issue we have with shock is that it's essentially where the body starts to, to shut down. It panics and, and doesn't have a normal distribution of the blood supply and also the oxygen in that blood supply. The positive sign at the moment is that Coco is taking deeper breaths. The most effective way of making sure the blood goes to the organs where it needs to go is by giving her a really strong dose of anti-inflammatories. So I'm just going to go into the muscle here. There we go. The hope is that between the oxygen and the very strong anti-inflammatory, we'll find a way to actually decrease the pressure on her brain and actually allow her to fight off the shock she's currently experiencing. So she's breathing a bit more easily there. I might just set up the x-ray and get a quick shot. In struggling to free herself, Coco could have injured her jugular, arteries, or worse still, her spinal cord. An x-ray will allow Chris to check whether the bone structure is still intact. X-ray! So I've just isolated that area around the neck that was actually stuck between those table legs. So what I'm looking for are any signs of any fractures or, or any areas of extra swelling that just shouldn't be there. All the critical things for survival are all in this one zone and they've all been crushed. So it gives you a great indication about why you're entitled to be so concerned. All our vertebrae are in place and we've got no little bony pieces coming off to the side there. So we've got no fractures. The only damage we must have in this neck region is soft tissue damage. My feeling is when those bars pressed in, it meant the blood flow was still able to get to the brain, but it just wasn't able to drain away through the veins. That meant, essentially, the blood pressure within the brain got really high. If that pressure inside of her skull has become too much, then there's always the risk she could have had a bleed, essentially had an aneurysm inside of her brain, and that could explain the signs we're seeing in her right now. Okay, okay. How are you feeling there? It was a play session that went wrong, wasn't it? Chris is closely monitoring little Coco. The biggest concern I've got is that what Coco is essentially facing at the moment is a strangulation injury. By being stuck between those bars, pushing on the sides of her neck, the artery flow would have been strong enough to force blood up into her brain, but the vein being a lower blood pressure would have meant that it never drained out. So she could actually have had a massive pressure build up inside of her brain. If that has occurred, then there's always a risk of something like a stroke occurring, a bleed inside the brain. That's it. Coco has been given oxygen and anti-inflammatories. The next few hours are quite critical to see exactly how she recovers, because if it's simply been a matter of her being stuck for a little while, being a bit stressed and now becoming a bit exhausted as a result of that, then she'll begin to improve fairly quickly. 
Coco's owner, Robert, has been anxiously waiting for news. So she's just here, she's just on oxygen though. Yeah, she's, look, she's doing okay. The little kitten also has two other special visitors, Robert's daughter, Kira, hey, and friend, hello. Ariella. How are you going? So I'm Chris. Hi. Nice to meet you guys. So you've obviously heard what's happened. So she's just resting here at the moment. You can see she's not too aware of what's going on around her at the moment. Mm -hmm. But what we're trying to work out is whether that's just because she's very tired, because she's had a very big day, or whether she may have actually done herself some damage. We're doing the best we can. I know she's doing the best she can as well. I promise you I'm not going to rest until we see some sort of sign of improvement from her. After seeing Coco's family this afternoon, clearly there is a lot of love for her out there and hopefully that does count for something. My wish is that over the next 12 hours or so, with some extra rest and with some more time for those drugs to take effect, she really does turn a corner. But at the moment, there's no way of knowing if that's going to happen. A lot of people at home that want you home as soon as possible. Alright Coco, you're a funny little thing aren't you? We might just use this chance while those eyes are open to have a look in there, just see what sort of response we're getting from the pupils. Chris is looking for any sign of improvement, however small, in little Coco. OK, yep, so we're getting a response there. If there's one thing that's worrying me, it's the fact that Coco still doesn't have much awareness of what's around her, and that's a, a really big hallmark of a brain injury. If there is one positive, it's the fact that her pupils are actually responding to the light. But it's been six hours since the accident and she's still not really showing too many signs of awareness and is still in that semi-comatose state. I would have hoped by now that we'd be starting to turn a corner and be starting to see some more positive signs. But you have to remember that Coco's young and today has been a day like no other. Are you all right? That's it. Chris is now concerned about the eight-week-old's hydration levels. I mean, it seems strange that just a few hours ago we were worried about almost too much blood pressure and now we're trying to replace that fluid in her system to make sure she doesn't become dehydrated. So it's just the challenge of looking after small kittens. Things change very quickly with them. All right, so she's now going to stay well hydrated. She's got those drugs on board from before. I think we're probably OK to actually give her a cage to rest in now. Yeah. OK. Coco will spend the night under observation at the clinic. OK, Coco. Welcome to your little hotel. So what we need to do is something you're very good at. Yeah, we're just sleeping. My hope is clearly that today has just been a massive day for her. And the reason she's so unresponsive is because she's simply exhausted. I'm not sure if I'm being too optimistic in thinking that, but hopefully with, say, 6, 12 hours, we'll start to see some more positive signs from her. See you later. Won't be too far away. What did you do with that kitten that couldn't keep its eyes open? Where did she go? Overnight rest has seen a remarkable improvement in little Coco. When I first look at Coco, I'm almost tempted to scan her microchip just to make sure this is the same kitten. And overall, it's chalk and cheese, isn't it? We're dealing with a different kitten this morning. You do see this with kittens. Their metabolic rate is so fast. Things move so quickly in their body that really, if you can give them half a reason to heal, quite often, they will take it. So if you can see it, I'm guessing, I'm gonna do this, which I know you don't like. You're gonna rinse up a bit, aren't you? Yeah, there we go, nice little blink. Pupils are constricting, it's good. It doesn't look like much, but for her to be seeing where I'm moving that white light around and eventually trying to swipe at it, that is the best sign we've seen from her in the last day. And now there's only one thing on the little battler's mind. <laughs> Thank you, I need that. Yeah, for patients that are as severely affected as Coco was, we usually withhold food. I use that a lot, yeah? But now, given the fact she's showing these signs of improvement, it's time to see just how hungry she is. 
normally kittens, they, they chew their food before they swallow it, not just inhale it. Don't want to talk right now? It's enough food for now. The stomach of yours is bulging. It was hard not to get caught up in the emotion of yesterday when Coco's family came and visited. But now, the really positive thing is I get to call them up and give them the good news. You said you are going to have to get better. And could you pull through for everyone and look what you've done. You just will keep on doing what you're doing. Yeah. You're looking good, aren't you? Yeah. A miraculous turnaround in Coco's recovery means she's finally able to go home. Chris phoned me today and said she's much better. She was jumping around, she bit his finger. Yeah. Coco's excited family can't wait to be reunited with their extra special little girl. Last night at home was uh, very quiet. We gotten used to a little cat bouncing around. Uh, she's quite a nocturnal cat, so yeah. she usually wakes up at about two o'clock in the morning and goes for a run around the house. So it was um, odd not having her there. Hello, guys. Hi, Chris. Hi. How are you? Are you good? Hey. Good. Do you want to come with me? Yeah. yeah. I think everyone remembers their first pets and remembers just how much they meant to them. So. I was never going to be the guy that had to tell those kids that Coco wasn't going home. So there's someone that's demanding an urgent meeting. <laughs> what do you think? Coco! What do you reckon? You're a pretty good judge. You know her pretty well. Yeah. How is she doing? She's purring. Yeah? She's better. So you're the vet here now. <laughs> so what do you think? Much better. Much better. Yeah. This isn't the cocoa we saw yesterday, right? No. Yeah. She's made a big improvement overnight. Ultimately, she just needed some time to relax, to rest, and, and try to get everything back on track. But as you can see, I don't think she's back to 100%, no. but that's a lot to expect that's within it. a day. Yeah. <laughs> There's no doubt that the brain is by far and away the most complicated organ in the body, so it makes sense that it's going to take multiple days, even weeks, for Coco to re-establish those connections, those pathways that allow her to jump around, to leap around like a normal kitten does. Absolutely. Big question for us, does she come home? You're pretty keen, right? Mm -hmm. This is where it becomes very hard on me because how do I say no <laughs> to you guys? How about we make a deal? Okay. So she can go home, Yeah. but she can't play with you guys too rough, and I'm led to believe she may play with the dog. Dog, yeah. So you can't let her play with the dog for a few days? Yeah. So there's nothing more to do than hand her over. Here we go, Tiki. She's all yours. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. As the owner of a kitten <laughs> that has a similar personality, I, I mean that when I say good luck. <laughs> Thank you. You, you're obviously going to have some good, very good times coming up. Okay. So, yeah. Lots of adventures. Yeah. Adventures of Coco. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I've got no doubt that this is the first of many adventures for Coco, but hopefully it is the most serious. And from here she does actually mature. She learns to behave just a little bit because there's that loving family that cares for her a lot. And I'm sure right now they can't imagine life without her. Hello. Hi, hello. Hey, Chris. How are you? How are you doing? I'm good. Very good to see you. Good to see hello. You. Hi. How are you going? Good. I'm almost nervous to ask. Hi. Where is she? She is uh, hiding. She's hiding under there. As for little Coco, she's finally recovered from her nasty fall a month ago and is back to her mischievous self. Oh, look at you! Butter wouldn't melt. When Coco went home, we were all very much aware of the fact it was going to be a long recovery. So I'm keen to see how she's changed. Wow. Oh, Ooh, a little yeah. miss, little miss like sensitive. <laughs> Has she mellowed? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's uh, as uh, energetic and full of adventure as usual. Yeah. Sort of climbing everything in, in the house, up and down, wherever she can go. Loves the garden. Yeah. And loves climbing trees. <laughs> climbing trees now. Yeah. Coco loves heights. She climbs all over the house, climbs into funny places. Uh, Coco's been stuck up a tree three times now and uh, requires somebody to climb the tree to go and fetch her and bring her down. 
So this is the famous or infamous table? It didn't come with the socks. The socks is the, the new safety feature wow. to, to keep her out. But that's where she got her head wedged down there. And the socks are now there too, so that she doesn't slip down and fall. But it seems so innocuous, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. if you look at that, you would never think that a cat would get their head stuck in there. But it just shows you, doesn't it, when they're so adventurous, just, yeah. anything's possible. Trees, tables. Huh? And health-wise, how's she going? Fine, she's uh, picking up weight. Yeah. So normally she's, well, nearly doubled in weight since we've had her. Yeah. She's a little play with your neck here. Yeah. <laughs> It's feeling good. It's not catching anywhere. There's no mm. resistance to that. The neck is moving nice and freely mm. there. And pulling those eyes are nice and open and, and certainly pointing straight oh, ahead. Yeah. Has she been clumsy at all since? She was, when she just came back, she was clumsy for quite a while. When she stood up, she just like, start walking forward. Mm. But it, it, you know, every day, you can actually nearly by hour see yeah. the improvement coming through. I mean, it's interesting because what you describe is exactly what someone that has a brain, brain injury has to yeah. go through yeah. is, is essentially teaching themselves to, to learn to walk, learn to have that coordination back again, yeah. and, and teaching the brain to, to function in a normal way and it shows you how serious it was yeah. for her. To see Coco today, it's so heartwarming to see how much she has recovered, how she is now back to normal, clearly enjoying home life and it feels amazing. I hope Scott's going to say your leg is all right. Is your leg going to be all right? In Isleworth, southwest of London, Anderson and Michael are very worried about their youngest chihuahua, Leo. He's such a spoiled boy. While the 11-month-old puppy seems on the surface to be perfectly happy playing with his best mate, Isabella, his devoted owners have detected a limp developing in his back left leg. In my heart, step, you know, Beating and saying, no, please, no, don't be anything serious. You know what you went through, hey? Oh, you don't want your brother to get sick, he's as well, no. Michael and Anderson have a very good reason to be protective. Are we OK to cut? Last year, Scott diagnosed their chihuahua Isabella with a heart condition that required major surgery, performed at the Royal Veterinary College. And while their little girl was fighting for her life, her brother Oscar was tragically killed after being run over by a car. Leo was a gift from friends to help them get over their loss. Leo, he's a, a ball of love. He filled a, a hole that we had in our heart, a big hole in our heart, and, uh, and he, he's just precious, really precious dog. X-rays have already been taken of Leo's hip and leg. Michael and Anderson will soon be heading off to see Scott to find out just what the x-rays reveal. We just thought, oh my gosh, we're really unlucky to be in this situation again. But we have to sort this out because we can see he's not well. Fingers crossed, hopefully he'll come out of it without going through surgery or under the knife. Because I can't imagine going through, the, uh, through that whole procedure again, to tell the honest truth. Isabella, do you remember where you are? Michael and Anderson have now arrived at the St. Margaret's practice in southwest London. Come on in, let's have a chat. Okay. okay, thank you. Scott has examined Leo's x-rays, and the Chihuahua's owners are about to find out just what's wrong with their 11-month-old puppy. Unfortunately, I haven't got the greatest of news to deliver. Uh, you guys really know how to pick them. This guy has a condition called leg calf perthes disease. It's a mouthful, but it's a degenerative condition of his hip joint. All right. This is Leo on his back. This is his spine and his pelvis here. Now, on this side, you can see the whole section of that, the end of the femur, is a little bit longer. It's definitely abnormal. The shape isn't the classic ball. And what you can see is that big black dot yeah. in the middle there, which shows that already the femoral head is starting to collapse, it's starting to break down. And that's where the discomfort is coming from. 
Michael and Anson know me well enough to be able to read my face and straight away they're anxious and upset. Sometimes life is just so cruel. So his hip joint is no good, it's cactus. And it will only continue to get worse, I'm afraid. It's such an extraordinary run of bad luck for these guys. They've had a dog that needed heart surgery. They've had a dog that was cruelly ripped from them as it got hit by a car. And now Leo has got a hip that's got some major problems with it. I mean, it's just so cruel. What is the procedure now? Sadly, the only way to fix this is surgery. Oh, I think I wasn't expecting that at all. No, it wasn't something we were expecting. I thought something is small, we can sort it here and now and then. And you have to go through the knife. Well, there's two very clear options surgically. Uh, one is something that I can do, which is removal of the femoral head and neck. And what it leads to is a free floating leg which sounds crazy, because you think you've got to have a joint, but uh, little dogs like this, they're very nimble, they're very light, and they can actually work very well with no hip joint. And it's the hip joint itself that's causing the pain in Leo, and that would be removed. The gold standard, however, is something called a total hip replacement. It is placing a false ball and a false socket into his hip, and completely replacing the degenerate one that he's got. Now that's unfortunately not something that I can do. It's highly specialised, particularly in a little dog like him. It's not very good news to hear that you have a little baby, such a small baby, has to go through it, unfortunately. And which, in your opinion, would be the better option? Well, guys, I'd say the gold standard, I think, is going and getting the total hip replacement. It's a massive surgery, but I think the benefits afterwards are considerable. And the fact that he is such a young dog and he's probably got a good 15 years to live, I think it's a, a worthy gamble. A worthy gamble. I think we've got no choice but go for the better option. Mm -hmm. <sighs> surgery again. Okay, yeah. I think we're gonna do the surgery, Scott. Leo will now be referred to Scott's orthopedic specialist surgeon, Michael Hamilton. To hear about a total hip replacement, they're very concerned, but I think they're also resolute. They want the best for Leo and they're willing to hold his little paw through it. No. No, we have to see Mike. It's gonna oh, be a big okay. surgery. Oh, God. Later that week, Michael arrives at Scott's referral hospital for Leo's total hip replacement. Hey. Weighing just over five pounds, the Chihuahua will be one of the smallest dogs to undergo the major surgery. I'm imagining the implant being so tiny and his bones being so small and then cutting that bone of his to put that implant is a bit overwhelming. While Michael's trying hard to be stoic, little Leo's doing his best tough guy impersonation. Leo, every time he sees a dog, he just explodes. Shush. It's like a little monster that comes out. Hello, Leo. This is Leo. How are you today? <laughs> he seems pretty chipper, doesn't he? Uh, yes. Scott has referred Leo to orthopaedic specialist surgeon Michael Hamilton. So you have standard hip replacement, which yeah. is kind of uh, Labradors, Jump Shepherds, okay. that kind of thing, which is this kind of size, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then they developed micro hip replacement, oh, okay. and now they've got nano hip nano. replacement. Oh, okay. He's that's a what the nano. He's a nano. <laughs> he's a nano total hip replacement. Yeah. Oh shit! The plan is that he's going to have a plastic on metal hip with no pain, with a normal range of motion, and he's going to be running around as a as a normal dog. That's, that's what we were that's, uh, that's, for. That's that's yes. the whole point. Let's go do a nano hip replacement. Let's do okay. it. Yes. Right, follow me. It's going to be really stressful until I get the call from Michael saying that the surgery has been all okay. There you go. You want to give your daddy a kiss? Um, there you go. Good luck. There we go. 
Right then. Michael, we'll speak later on. All right. Okay, I'll right. Okay. okay. Don't worry. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much. Come on then, you. Let's get you sorted out. As Leo is prepped for his operation by nurses Kim and Claire, Good boy. Surgeon Michael knows this is going to be a challenging day. The thing about Leo's hip replacement is he's tiny. There's very little room for error here. So the, the adrenaline right now is, is, is pumping. Michael is now taking further x-rays to be absolutely sure just how much space there is for the hip implant. X-rays. He's worried even the smallest nano implant may not fit into Leo's tiny hip joint. The smallest one that they make, which is what we've got, is 10, and that measures 10. So it's a bit of a no-brainer in terms of selection of implant size. As, as expected, given these two kilos, it, it's, it's the smallest one they make, and he's right on the edge, right on the edge. Like I said, they measure, this measures 10, it's 10 millimeters. It's gonna be on the wire. It's like way for thin now. I can't go any further, otherwise I'm gonna go through. So that's, that's it, that's as far as we can go. Orthopedic surgeon Michael Hamilton has reached the crucial stage of Leo the Chihuahua's total hip replacement. So I just gotta go for it now and hope it's good. That's the socket there. The specialist is now carefully positioning a new nano polyethylene plastic hip socket inside the tiny dog. If I move now as the cement starts to set, we're gonna lose some of the bonding that we've got. But I think that looks from here quite good. Right. Next, the diseased head of Leo's femur will be replaced by a new metal ball. If the prosthetic implants fit precisely, they should work as effectively as a normal, healthy joint. We're basically trying to make a hole inside the bone for this to fit with a little bit of cement around it. But the fragility of Leo's tiny bone is making Michael very nervous. I can see this thing moving around inside the bone. Wow, that is getting really thin. If we go too far, we break the bone and we're a lot worse off than we were before we started. So yeah, that's a real kind of uh, edgy seat time. Oh, not quite. Tight. Do you know what? I need another millimetre. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> this is so, so tight. <sighs> so but basically what I'm doing, I, I, I just keep putting this thing back in, because if this thing fits, we're good. <sighs> and I think that actually good. is pretty good. We've got this implant now to fit, so this is it. we just got to now cement this thing in. Go, 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 go. Michael is using a medical cement, which is a mixture of powder and liquid and contains antibiotics. There's actually a very small window of when that cement is easy to work with and actually going to be effective to use. That You've got to put it in there and get your implant in, and then once you're happy, you've got to just stay put. Because if you start moving around as the cement starts to set, you're just going to debond the thing from the cement and it's just not going to work. Very, 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 very careful. <laughs> right. So this is the actual implant. In she goes. And I need to just try and make sure that that is lined up. She's in. She's in. The fact that she's in is... Good. ...is pretty damn good, I have to say. <laughs> Whew! That, I think, is probably one of the fiddliest stops I've ever done. And that feels pretty good. Let's go x-ray, see what it's like. This is now the, the really stressful way for orthopaedic surgeons because there's, there's no hiding place on the x-rays, you know? I mean, worst case scenario, this hip might have popped out. That would be a total disaster and I'll be, I'll be crying. We need to get one of those. X-rays. That's good. Fingers crossed. This view here is for us to assess the way that the stem sits in the middle of the femur and it's, it's, it's really good, it's really good. Uh, it's in the middle, it's in for a start, so that makes me happy. 
Yeah, happy with that. Oh, he's been such a brave little fella. We've got you a lovely soft bed for the night. So for now, Michael is satisfied, but Leo is not out of danger yet. He will need constant supervision and cage rest for the next month to make sure the new implant stays in place while the soft tissues heal and the muscle mass around it increases. One attempted jump onto the bed and, you know, that hip could be not where it should be and would be quite easy to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory here. You got a new hip, mate. You're really lucky. Hey, it's a good boy. Hey, Maya, where's your friend Leo? Where is he? There he is! Two days after Leo's nerve-wracking hip replacement, the tiny chihuahua is at home with his surgeon, Michael Hamilton. The specialist is giving him round-the-clock supervision before returning the dog to his owners. It's a bit of a one-off, to be honest with you, but um, he's, he's the smallest hip replacement that we've done. And um, I, I just wanted to really, really keep a close eye on him in the, in, for the first couple of days. Michael's dog, Sausage and Bumble, are not impressed with the house guest. It's your little friend. Oh, but one-year-old Maya is besotted. Oh, gently, gently. My God. Two babies to look after at the same time, crikey. He's had a major operation and he's got better extension and is less painful than he was pre-op already. So, you know, I'm really pleased. Can I say hello to Maya? There we go. Are you going to miss him when he goes home? Are you going to miss him? Oh. But while Maya won't be happy about losing her new buddy, that afternoon, Leo's relieved owner, Anderson, can't wait to see his little boy. Excuse me. Hello, hello Michael. Sir. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Andy. How do you do? Oh, hello. Okay, hello. Can I? Can I? Sorry. He oh, come to daddy, come. There we go. Yeah, come to uh. daddy. <laughs> Hello, yeah. He's missed yeah. you. It's been terrible. This morning at seven o'clock, I was awake, waiting for the time to come here. <laughs> I miss you so much, my little one. Yeah, you're going now. So he's been at our house the last two nights. You know, he's been getting waiting on hand and foot. Anderson walks in and it's literally just, uh, I'll see you later. It's quite funny. Ah. Hmm. While the hip replacement is working so far, Michael wants to ensure Leo's handled with kid gloves for at least the next six weeks. The most important thing is rest. Okay. And we don't want to be charged around off lead because if he does that, potentially things can move around and we can get a problem. If he's good at six weeks, I'll be pretty happy. And then as his exercise increases and he's off lead at 12 weeks and I get a video of him flying around off lead, then, I, then I'll relax. Okay, All nice. the best. Okay, you take, take care. Well. Take it easy. Let's see you, Leo. Let's see Daddy and Isabella. Yeah, they are waiting for you. Yeah, they are waiting for you, my little. Let's go home. See? Isabella, where are you? Let's go, yeah. 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 Come on, where's the ball? Go, 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 go. 12 weeks after his hip replacement surgery, the Chihuahua is finally allowed to run free in the park with his sister, Isabella. Go ahead, Leo. Where's the ball? Leo's doing really well. We're really happy with the outcome of the surgery. Fit, fit, fit. It's a relief for devoted owners Michael and Anderson, who have endured two tough years with their pets. No more surgeries, no more nothing. Touch uh, wood. Touch wood, <laughs> yes. Because the thing is... It's a bit too much. <laughs> for the last two years, it's been a living nightmare. And now, hopefully, it just just Maybe be just happy happiness. days. Happiness, <laughs> happiness. Just happy days from now on. <laughs> Hopefully. Praise the Lord. <laughs> hello there, gents. This is a happy oh, scene. Good to oh, see you. Scott. Hello, puppies. How are you? How are you, Leo? Leo is dancing away, chasing balls with Isabella. It's a massive difference from the last time I saw Leo. Good boy. Where he was constantly lifting his leg up, he was in pain. But now Leo is walking comfortably and beautifully in the park. OK, let's have a little look at him, shall we? Yeah. Hello, mate. 
Oh, that's good extension. It feels beautifully smooth, it's moving well, and all the muscles and support tissues around that hip are doing very well, so it's a really good result. Where's Leo watch? There he is. Should we watch him walk? And there's two other people who are thrilled with Leo's progress. His surgeon, Michael, and the Chihuahua's number one fan, Maya. He's got a new hip. Yeah, there he is. Ah, He was your little friend. Do you remember him? Love. Love. Yes. Oh, happiness. All happiness, no more surgery. Guys, agreed? No more surgery. <laughs> <laughs> I think he resounding knows. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dr. Danny Dusek. If you love our show and want to see more amazing stories from the Bondi Vet team, just hit the subscribe button. Click that little notification bell and we'll see you for our next video.